Today we're talking about the United States Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer. Although United States trade today might be better represented by a dumpster fire. Now you might be thinking, wow that sounds important considering we've learned more about trade in the last few months than at any point in human history. And he's critical to all of these negotiations going on right now. With Mexico's economic minister saying any deal where Lighthizer is not responsible for the architecture doesn't see the light of day. And you know what that means, right? This guy's flying to China, to Mexico, to Canada, to Europe, just negotiating tariffs with anybody who's willing to listen at this point. So why have you probably never heard of him? But well, one of the keys to Robert Lighthizer's success in the administration has been his careful avoidance of the spotlight. So, oh man, yeah, I'm sorry, don't mean to blow your cover there. I can talk about something else. Basically, someone asks, hey, who's negotiating all of these tariffs I'm hearing about? And he responds, Nike's using Colin Kaepernick in their advertisements. All the while, Trump takes credit for these trade achievements. So before we get into trade strategy today, let's get a little background on Lighthizer. He got his international trade starting working as the deputy trade representative under Reagan. So that's impressive. Frankly, Ronald Reagan. You remember, I didn't love his, I thought he was great. I loved his style, his attitude. He was a great cheerleader for, our, you know, for the country, but not great on the trade. Well, okay, he said it, not me. In this period, he started developing a somewhat special ideology that's referred to as Lighthizerism. Although many economists would say it's special like the third grader who still eats glue. Now let me know if this sounds familiar, but his main achievement in this period was that he wielded the threat of tariffs to persuade Japan and other countries to cut their steel shipments to the United States. And to anyone who's worried that, oh man this guy sounds so professional, maybe this guy isn't unhinged or disrespectful enough to be interesting at all. Never fear, because according to Bloomberg, at one point the trade talks on steel imports were dragging on, and Robert Lighthizer didn't care for the Japanese offer. So he folded it into a paper airplane and launched it across his desk at Japan's lead negotiator. Man, I remember a time when that story would have actually been shocking. Or then there was the time when, during one of the Japanese presentations on steel, he devoted his attention to playfully disassembling his microphone. Well, at least he didn't eat it, or throw it at the Japanese trade minister. How hard is it to give a presentation with going on in the background anyway? Who would have loved it if he had a comment at the end and needed to borrow someone else's mic because, well, I broke mine. So let's get into Lighthizerism. It basically views post Reagan trade politics as a series of mistakes, starting from From the developed world to the developing world. The tariff reductions in the GATT deal are expected to sow the seeds of global economic growth, pumping $500 billion into the global economy over the next decade. The deal also creates a new World Trade Organization, the WTO. Envoys from around the world agreed in Geneva to launch the organization on January the 1st. And then expanding the WTO to admitting China. Now generally when you hear anger about this, it's because they're taking their jobs. Which, alright. According to the Labor Department, employers added 201,000 jobs last month. That was more than expected. Meanwhile, the nation's unemployment rate held steady at 3.9%, an 18-year low. If they're taking our jobs, then they're doing a really bad job of it. Unfortunately, this eliminates one of millennials' best excuses to get a real job, said the guy on YouTube. Traditional responses would correctly be to point out that American manufacturing isn't really a thing anymore. But if you look at this graph, well, it would take some serious mental gymnastics not to see the point they're making. I mean, that drop is so bad I thought I was looking at Tesla's stock price there for a second. It's almost like there are other industries out there that aren't manufacturing. To put it another way, mainstream economists would compare this to during the Industrial Revolution, a person complaining about all the farm jobs disappearing while everyone's going to work in the factories. Lighthizerism is kind of the response to this observation and is a more strategy to get fair trade than free trade. That's what I was hired to do and that's what I'm going to worry about. 
Uh, China has an industrial policy that involves a lot of subsidies, a lot of dumping, a lot of forced technology transfer, all these sorts of things. So yeah, this all isn't just about jobs. I mean, there's some legitimate unfair trade activities that China is engaging in that Lighthizer is probably going to try to correct in trade negotiations. And if you're interested in that, I did an episode all about that. I'll link to that at the end screen. The philosophy of Lighthizerism is more complicated than the Trump protectionism that I described above. To quote Foreign Policy magazine, to call Lighthizer a prophet of protectionism as some have gives the false impression of an underlying drive for US autarky, self-sufficiency, or withdraw from global markets. Alright, we get it foreign policy, you have a thesaurus. Nothing could be further from the truth. Wow, dramatic. Although two years in the Trump administration and I think I can come up with a few things further from the truth. A better explanation of what he wants is an environment in which we're competing based on economics, not based on artificial barriers to, to trade, not based on tariffs, not based on subsidies, which is an important part of this because the United States is relatively not a subsidizer, that the United States will do very well and economics will determine these things, who ends up succeeding and who doesn't. Well, that sounds a lot like the WTO. You should check it out. You might like it. But there's one huge difference. Lighthizerism scorns the multilateral approach in favor of bilateralism or deals between two nations to lower barriers. Well, that actually explains a lot of decisions for this administration. For example, the recent case of We're going to call it the United States Mexico trade agreement. And we'll get rid of the name NAFTA. Yeah, we're replacing NAFTA with an American Mexican trade deal. That's like replacing the Beatles with Paul McCartney in the wings. I think a major component is missing. While Canada ended up joining the treaty, it was very much negotiated as a bilateral deal until the last second. Or remember how we pulled out of the TPP? He was elected and he did get out. He then indicated that, that he would, and I think his exact words were, he would be willing to discuss or an improved TPP either with the 11 or individually with countries. In my opinion, I'm better off going to these other countries and, and it, it's easier than trying to get 11 people to change something that they just agreed to. And let me tell you, the international trade organizations have taken a notice of the United States new down with the system hot topic attitude. Countries rushed to file formal complaints with the World Trade Organization, the WTO. China and the European Union are among those not only protesting President Trump's steel and aluminum tariffs, but now demanding official WTO intervention. But does the WTO have teeth anymore when it comes to resolving these burgeoning trade battles? So instead of a WTO-based system, what does Lighthizerism envision? He promotes a transactional system instead, proceeding deal by deal and case by case. Now this starts to get a little more eh, because to get to the end point of better access and lower barriers, Lighthizer sees little shame in using unilateral action. So it's less like, hey Mexico, I scratch your back and you scratch mine, and more like, hey Mexico, you better scratch my damn back right now or I'll tariff you to the stone age, and then maybe I'll scratch your back after that. Executive orders, diplomatic pressure, and legal measures like the aforementioned Section 232 steel and aluminum tariffs are legitimate tools he's using for unsettling existing agreements and pushing partners to the negotiating table. So what's the problem with multi-country agreements? Well, in his opinion, the main problem is the quote free traders criticize you and the administration for using this outdated federal statute to go after China. Look, it's a very effective tool. We'll use the WTO when we can. The president's willing to act unilaterally when he has to. And when we say it's cold rolled air, look at Ronald Reagan used it and he used it very effectively and it made a big difference for our trade policy. Ah, back to Ronald Reagan from the intro, because you remember that's where Lighthizer started. See, it's all coming together. His problem with the WTO is that it's weak on countries like China who are just dipping their toe into free market capitalism. That state does a lot of things that, well, they're tolerated by the WTO but are illegal under US law. So we're going to tariff the heck out of them until we can get a free trade agreement that we directly control instead of a multilateral trade agreement associated with the WTO. 
Their fear for Lighthizer is less about the trade deficit and more about the US losing its edge in technology. Because its companies are being forced to hand over intellectual property to do business in China. Which China can do because it's really hard to tell where business ends and the state starts. I mean, if the United States started negotiating contracts for Google, well, that would be quite strange and quite honestly be one of the few things that could make Google Hangouts less popular than it already is. Is it still hanging out if you're alone? A lot of things start to make a lot of sense when you think about it this way. I saw this poll that 91.5% of all economists oppose tariffs. I'm surprised it's that low. I would have thought it's 100% <laughs> or against. I mean, that's one of the premier uh, uh, conditions for prosperity is freer trade. But what Trump is doing, what President Trump is doing right now is trying to bring China to the table to get him to negotiate freer trade, not more restricted trade. And the only thing he has available to him is, of course, tariffs. Then the end goal is to bring American trade back to the 1980s when the WTO is just America telling everyone what to do. This leads to the last question. Why do people like the WTO? Peer pressure? Hey, the Europeans are doing it, so it must be good. Well, if the Europeans jumped off a fiscal cliff, would you? There are two benefits to having a bunch of nations agree to the same thing. First, it's just easier. If you have a 5% duty to Greece and a 7% duty to Britain, or some things you need to make have certain licenses, but here you need different tests and materials. It gets really scream into a pillow really quickly. The other main benefit to these agreements is its impact on accountability. Take for example the Iran deal, where the majority of clout was in the fact that other nations signed onto it. I mean, if Obama went alone to negotiate with Iran, it would have probably changed about as much as... President Trump tonight, before ever meeting with Kim Jong-un, already dangling a second summit here in the US, if next week's face-to-face -face goes well. Yeah, those North Korean sanction negotiations did not go well, because we've so thoroughly sanctioned that country that the only thing they export is tragic news stories. The key there is China, a country that is, as many note, not America. So a bilateral trade agreement is already starting to seem eerily multilateral. That's an extreme version meant to provide an example, but a more reasonable situation would be something like Vietnam in the 2000s. During the Bush administration, the United States trade representative was in negotiations for a bilateral investment treaty with Vietnam, which would have contained an investor state dispute settlement provision, or something that we wanted but they weren't too keen on. Anyways, nothing really happened until we created a trans-pacific partnership. At which time, leveraging Vietnamese trade to Japan, we got them to finally agree to those terms. Anyways, our trade representative is trying to live in America's 1980s glory days, and pundits are not sure yet whether to slap on a Queen album a neon green leotard and join him quite yet. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to support independent, nonpartisan comedy news, remember to subscribe by clicking on this floating logo to the right of my head, or do it the old fashioned way by clicking the subscribe button below. Ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring, and remember to give me a thumbs up if you liked what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.